At that point, uh, we realize we need to pay a little bit more of attention, and as it gets closer, we decide it'd probably be best to get to the basement. And when I opened that door, I was staring right at a black wall. And when I looked at it, I couldn't see around the sides of it. I had to put my hands cup around my um, eyes so that I could see up against the glass. And I looked across the street and I saw these oak trees swaying literally almost at a 45 degree angle. And then I realized there's this really strange feeling when you realize that you're gonna die. I knew this was gonna be bad. I just didn't know how bad. The wind was rushing so fast and the wind was blowing so hard you couldn't even hear the windows blow out. And then the building just blew up. The velocity of the wind, I thought it was literally gonna just peel the tissue off our face. Literally, a rooftop fell and landed in the parking lot. The rain starts to make almost a sideways rain as the wind blows so hard out of the north. I guess I'm gonna die here. And I thought about my kids. What it looked like to me was the inside of a building that's been bombed. Put a call out to all off-duty New County deputies to report in for duty. They said, prepare to be here a while. We've got many deaths. You know, the whole time you're thinking, well, this is gonna kill me, but I can't die yet. Our family's been here since the 1800s. They basically migrated from Germany, moved to Chicago. They didn't have any bakeries here, so the family moved here and set up a baking business. I'm a pharmacist here. Um, I studied pharmacy at the University of Oklahoma. After graduation, I had several jobs, and then I bought my own pharmacy across the street from the Mercy Hospital. I'm an interventional cardiologist specializing in practicing both uh, coronary artery disease treatment management as well as peripheral artery, the like leg arteries. I'm Rob Chaplin, Jasper County Coroner for the state of Missouri. Uh, Joplin is our largest town. I live north of Joplin, uh, five minutes away, and as long as I can access all of the county, uh, take care and service. Joplin is situated on the edge of what's known as Tornado Alley a strip of America notorious for vicious and violent storms. In the spring, tornadoes are a common appearance. The hospital was busy, uh, especially a really busy regional medical center because a lot of people, it was very common for them to drive 60 or 80 miles in a radius, and that probably encompassed three or 400,000 people. And there weren't any larger middle size or large towns nearby. It was served as a as a major healthcare center for the community. The four states area is where Arkansas, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri all meet. The city of Joplin services this four state area. Growing up, you know, we would see little tornadoes, but they usually covered a block or so. You know, the sirens would go off. The sirens go off all the time here. Probably heard us as many times as the sirens went off and nothing ever happened. So you just get to where you're not too concerned about those. You figure you can make it to safety or you'll know something is serious in time. It was a Sunday. It was a hot day. It was sunny. There was some talk about bad weather in the afternoon and the staff was talking about that we may get some warning from the hospital system through the intercom about exercising what they call condition gray. It's a warning that inclement weather, such as tornadoes, thunderstorms, are in the vicinity and that one should, staff-wise, help prepare the patients in case of emergencies. I was at home with family. It was a Sunday afternoon. The weather 
patient had been predicting, you know, a strong chance for storm. So we were keeping an eye on the system. My kids were out back playing in the backyard and uh, we were watching the radar and we saw this system moving down out of Kansas, moving east, and then it dropped to the southeast. And uh, at this point, the skies are still clear, the sun's still shining, kids are outside, we got our eyes on them. The most immediate warning system in the area is a simple air raid siren to alert citizens of possible tornadoes approaching and to take immediate cover. Our pharmacy was open to 8.30 till uh, 10.30 at that time, uh, seven days a week. So it was a typical Sunday. I was actually, um, had just taken care of some customers and my technician was up front and I went to the back and was working on some book work. What basically helped me was the fact I didn't replace my battery backups. And so when the electricity was surging, my computer rebooted and that never happens because the power's super stable there with the hospital being across the street. So I checked, looked up front, and those computers had rebooted also. I thought that was strange. And then I looked at the fluorescent bulbs, and they were buzzing and flickering. And I've never seen that with fluorescent bulbs before. I looked out front and it wasn't that uh, dark or threatening. And the wind didn't seem that bad. So I thought, well, maybe a semi-truck or something big hit a bunch of poles behind us and caused some weird surges coming in. I could see in front of the store. I couldn't see out the back because it's, it was a door and all solid center block. And so there weren't any windows to the back. Across the street at the hospital, staff tells Dr. Smalley the storm is approaching. I had just like walked out of one of the coronary care units. There was a series of rooms on the south side of the hospital and then there was a series of rooms in the coronary care unit on the north side. And on each side of the building were basically glass. It was just plate glass. And I was having a discussion with the CCU staff. They were discussing that, hey, Dr. Smalling, we you hear that there's been some condition grays and we're concerned about it, but we're keeping an eye on it. And I'm like, okay. And so I sat down to begin to write a progress note on a patient. And one of the nurses uh, or staff said, wow, it, if I didn't know better, it looks like we're gonna have a tornado. And I was like, oh yeah, right. I mean, we're always talking about that, but you know, we haven't seen one in years. He said, no, I'm not kidding. And so I got up and I really couldn't see outside. The lights were reflecting and it was like at night. The system moves closer and then it drops further to the south, which we're in that path. And at that point, uh, we realize we need to pay a little bit more of attention. And as it gets closer, we decide it'd probably be best to get to the basement because they said this system had the potential uh, for a strong tornado. We weren't making our way to the basement. Uh, we could hear the tornado sirens going off because it is a walkout basement. I can see out the windows to the west, which is helpful to see the storm approaching and also let you see what the weather's doing. I couldn't see too far away, uh, but I could see enough of the clouds to know that it was dark and it was a thunderstorm. So we have a deadbolt because we had a lot of people trying to break in and I had to remove that deadbolt to get the back door open to see behind me. When I opened that door, I was staring right at a black wall. And when I looked at it, I couldn't see around the sides of it. And then when I looked up, it didn't end. And so I'd never seen anything quite like that. But it, it was making a noise like a, basically like rolling thunder, yet kind of a huge turbine engine. 
I looked up the window and I had to put my hands cup around my um, eyes so that I could see up against the glass and my eyes had to adjust and and it was green uh, gray it was raining the wind was blowing really hard stations National Weather Service has issued a tornado warning the storm has a history of producing funnel clouds and tennis ball size hail there was nothing really that was in front of me that close to the hospital that I could get a bearing on what was happening. But as I was able to focus my gaze about 300 yards north of the hospital, and I saw these, and I knew how big these oak trees were, swaying literally almost at a 45 degree angle. And they weren't doing it together. They were whipping back and forth all over the place. And then I noticed something in the foreground out to the left, and I began to look, and what it was, it was materials dropping out of the sky. Literally, a rooftop fell and landed in the parking lot. It was a Sunday afternoon. The weather station had been predicting, you know, a strong chance for storms. When the electricity was surging, my computer rebooted, and that never happens. I looked out front, and it wasn't that, uh, dark or threatening. One of the nurses said, wow, if I didn't know better, it looks like we're going to have a tornado. The system moves closer and then it drops further to the south, which we're in that path. And at that point, uh, we realize we need to pay a little bit more of attention. And as it gets closer, we decide it'd probably be best to get to the basement. And when I opened that door, I was staring right at a black wall. And when I looked at it, I couldn't see around the sides of it. I had to put my hands cup around my eyes so that I could see up against the glass. And I looked across the street and I saw these oak trees swaying literally almost at a 45 degree angle. A rooftop fell and landed in the parking lot. We had an anonymous phone call of two funnel clouds in the Lomo Linda area. The wind is really starting to pick up here. And then I knew immediately what it was. I mean, your whole life you grow up with tornadoes, you know it's a tornado. You just don't know how big, and you don't know where it's at. So I yelled, there's a tornado, everybody take cover. The medical staff takes cover, hoping there's enough time to save themselves. Their hope is to help others in the aftermath of the storm, if they survive. I stepped maybe 10, uh, 12 feet, just around the little uh, corner, really wasn't even part of a room. The group takes cover. Meanwhile, at the pharmacy, it's a race against time. I knew we were in serious trouble, uh, but I knew I had a little time. So I closed the door and just was deciding my next step. And uh, I, my plan was to always get across the street to. Uh, St. John's, but to get over there and get into the basement. Because all I had to do was run across the street, a little bit diagonally. And so I told my technician, I didn't tell her what I saw, because I was afraid she might faint. I just thought to keep her focused, I said, we need to go, we need to go now. And I said, just forget everything. And I said, maybe we can make St. John's or my car. You know, I was gonna decide when I got outside, When I got outside the door and I looked behind me, she wasn't with me. I thought, well, where in the heck did she go? So I went back in. I would forgot the store clerk. And when I came back in, I was having trouble getting the door closed because it jerked it out of my hands, the pressure coming up behind us. And I finally got it closed and, and I locked it uh, to make it stay closed. But then when I told him that we, we had to go and we had to go now. And then when I look at the glass, because the whole front of the store, it's a convenience store, it's all glass. And everything was coming straight at the glass. So I knew we weren't going to make it now. Because if we went out, we went into the funnel. Remain calm even though it's probably the hardest thing to do, is probably the one thing that maybe could save your life. 
That's probably the most important thing, but also the hardest thing. It's a lot of self-talk. Probably losing it, but you got to talk yourself out of losing it. Self-talk is pretty much what the words say. It is talking to the self. It can be a, an excellent way of coping. It's sort of saying to yourself things like, I can do this, and that can help a person to get through the very difficult moments. When I yelled for everybody to take cover, what I was thinking of was not so much about my safety or my staff's safety, but more like, well, what are we gonna do with the patients? How are we gonna protect them? Because they just have plate glass on either side of them, and there's nothing but some desk between the two sides of the coronary care unit. So desks and that's it. So I worried about if the winds were very strong, if there was any glass breakage or flying glass, it could be very hazardous to their health. And then I realized um, there's this really strange feeling when you realize that you're gonna die. I yelled, there's a tornado, everybody take cover. I knew we were in serious trouble at that point. When I got outside the door and I looked behind me, she wasn't with me and everything was coming straight at the glass. I knew we weren't gonna make it now because if we went out, we went into the funnel. And then the rain starts to make almost a sideways rain as the wind blows so hard out of the north. Remain calm, even though it's probably the hardest thing to do, is probably the one thing that maybe could save your life. That's probably the most important thing, but also the hardest thing. It's a lot of self-talk. Sort of saying to yourself things like, I can do this, and that can help a person to get through the very difficult moments. When I yelled for everybody to take cover, what I was thinking of was not so much about my safety or my staff's safety, but more like, well, what are we gonna do with the patients? And then I realized there's this really strange feeling when you realize that you're gonna die. Rob tries calling 911 to see where he can help. He still doesn't know the extent of damages as his home is outside of the main path of the storm. When he can't reach the operators at 911, he realizes the potential for casualties is high. The conversation my wife and I were having at that point was something is devastatingly just horrible. It's something for 911 to be down, uh, cell phone towers to be just eaten up because of the high volume of calls. You just know that something tragic has happened. But again, you just don't ex expect it to be on the level that it actually turned out to be. You're almost in disbelief that it can actually happen to you. I knew this was going to be bad. I just didn't know how bad. So I said, we've got to get to the center bathrooms because I knew how it was constructed. We didn't have a basement. We had little options. So I didn't have time to take anybody by their hand. I just said, we, we've got to get to, to the bathrooms. And I'd looked at the beer coolers, but I didn't want to be around glass because I didn't know how bad this was going to be. If you don't have access to a basement, the best place to hide in your house would be uh, a room in the center of the house that has no windows. As a last ditched effort, I guess you could get in your car and try to outrun it, but it's not advisable. A bathroom, a small bathroom, is always going to be tightly constructed with framing, so that gives you quite a bit of protection. It's a pretty tough box. I ended up sliding in on the floor, grabbed the side of the commode, and braced myself. My technician walked in behind me. She wondered what I was doing in a dirty public bathroom on the floor grabbing the toilet. I think I was in the women. I chose that one because it was the one furthest from the outer wall. And uh, it was in the center of the building, which I knew the way it was constructed. It would probably be my safest spot. So she's kind of started to crouch down, and then the building just blew up. That forced her down to the floor but in a good position in a way because she was on her chest, basically. But the thing that she did, she grabbed my collar 
and she was choking me because it was trying to suck us both off the commode. And I was afraid she was going to get us both sucked out. And so I finally took the one hand here and got her hand down to the base of the commode. Okay, so she was hanging onto the base now. The pressures were so great and the wind velocity was so high. I didn't think we could withstand that and actually live. When I stepped around the corner, there was about three other nurses, staff, who were there with me, and I just we just all huddled up into the corner, the little alcove, and and they're they're shaking, and one of them was like, "Well, we we're really having a tornado," and so I was saying like, "Yeah, we are," and the other person was like saying, well, do you think we're going to hurt? And we're like, well, we're in the interior of the building. We're as safe as we can be. We have tornadoes, have had them for decades. But all of a sudden, you realize that if it hits this hospital, we have really very little, if any, cover. And these people that are around us are going to need our help. And we don't know how long it's going to last. The wind was rushing so fast, and the wind was blowing so hard, you couldn't even hear the windows blow out. You could hear people screaming barely, and it got louder and louder. And as oftentimes tornadoes are described, it sounds like a freight train. The, the part of the freight train is not so much the shaking, but it's the loud volume. It's not even a roar. It's just a real intense, low rumble, mechanical sound. And I thought, you know, I guess I'm gonna die here. And I thought about my kids. You couldn't talk because the noise was just terrific. Um, I could faintly hear her trying to scream, is what I remember. And, um, you know, everything was just in tatters. All you could do was hang on, close your eyes, tuck into a fetal position, basically. Just hang on for dear life. I was thinking, what am I gonna do if the commode breaks the base? What am I gonna grab next? You know, the whole time you're thinking, well, this is gonna kill me. I can't die yet. I have a wife and two kids. And then the rain starts to make almost a sideways rain as the wind blows so hard out of the north. And then I realized um, there's this really strange feeling when you realize that you're gonna die. I knew this was gonna be bad. I just didn't know how bad. We've gotta to get to the bathrooms. I ended up sliding in on the floor, grabbed the side of the commode, and then the building just blew up. She grabbed my collar, and she was choking me because it was trying to suck us both off the commode. The other person was like saying, well, do you think we're gonna hurt? The wind was rushing so fast, and the wind was blowing so hard, you couldn't even hear the windows blow out. It's not even a roar. It's just a real intense, low rumble, mechanical sound. And I thought, you know, I guess I'm gonna die here. You couldn't talk because the noise was just terrific. You know, the whole time you're thinking, well, this is gonna kill me. I can't die yet. And then I thought, no, I don't wanna die here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight. Uh, I don't know how I'm gonna protect myself, but when this is over, we've got to do something to help these patients. And so, it lasted maybe 90 seconds. It wasn't a long time, but it was too slow, too long. After the howling, then we heard intense hailing. Then it hailed really hard for maybe 60 to 90 seconds, and then it stopped. And then we could hear the building, and we heard ding, 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 which is basically the alarms going off. I kept these keys from the tornado because I've got my my uh, fob on it that I need for my account. I couldn't afford to lose these. I was trying to hang on to those and also trying to hold myself in. And it kept pulling and pulling on these keys so much that it finally pulled them through my fingers and away from me, even though I, you know, I was desperately trying to keep them. Uh, the velocity of the wind, I thought it was literally gonna peel the tissue off our face. 
At this point, Rance and his colleague are unaware that the building protecting them has been torn away by the tornado. Now, they're completely vulnerable as the storm rolls over them. I didn't think we would survive that much pressure, but we did. And the strange thing was, once we survived that first blast and removed the building and everything, then I finally, the wind started dying down. And when I got my eye open, I looked at my forearm and I had, how the heck do I have bright sunlight on me? So I looked up and I'm looking at the sun. I mean, the bright light coming through. And I thought, I have to be in the center of this thing. I mean, what could explain that, okay? So I, I could talk then because it was quiet in the center, okay? Um, there wasn't any debris hitting us in the center. And I really didn't see that much swirling around. It was just clear and kind of calm. Um, and I told Desi, I said, hang on, hang on, hang on. I just knew there was going to be more coming. And sure enough, I had about 10 seconds, maybe 15, inside that, inside the eye. Then the back wall rolled over us. And so when that rolled over us, that was the worst part because we didn't have a building to start with to protect us. So now we're really open to the elements. The tornado is massive and violent. On the enhanced Fujita scale, it reaches the EF5 level meaning winds are in excess of 320 kilometers per hour, powerful enough to rip steel and concrete from the structure of buildings. So that's when, boy, we just got hit with everything. I mean, stuff was just clubbing us and coming in. And I had the sink on my leg, and I thought it was going to sever my right leg. If it was sharp, it would have taken my leg. But anyway, we were, we were pretty lucky all in all. And then we got out of the rubble. I stepped out from where I was standing and there's soot covering everything, dirt. And then there was this misty smoke or haze or something. And I see that all the desks, everything is destroyed. There's mud all over the windows. You can't really tell where the patients are at. Thankfully, uh, where we were located, we were outside of the, the storm area. 10, 15 minutes later, people are coming on the radio that uh, Walmart's gone, it's been destroyed. Home Depot, it's gone, it's leveled. What, what's really strange is when the tornado was actually happening, and for that, I don't know, three minutes of total tornado, bad hail. When it was all gone and over, it was quiet, like dead quiet, eerie quiet. And, and yet when I stepped out, I wasn't wet. I thought I would be. Somehow, by a miracle, where we were standing, we were not in the way of the, the storm. And we were crawling over desks and over rubble and things and what it looked like to me was the inside of a building that's been bombed. And then I thought, no, I don't want to die here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight. After the howling, then we heard intense hailing, about the size of a baseball. And it kept pulling and pulling on these keys so much that it finally pulled them through my fingers and away from me. The velocity of the wind, I thought it was literally gonna peel our skin off our face. When I looked at my forearm and I had I have bright sunlight on it. Okay, so I'm thinking, now how the heck do I have bright sunlight on me? All the desks, everything is destroyed. What it looked like to me was the inside of a building that's been bombed. Walmart's gone, it's been destroyed. I have to be in the center of this thing. And um, then the back wall rolled over us. And so when that rolled over us, that was the worst part because we didn't have a building to start with to protect us. So that's when, boy, we just got hit with everything. I mean, stuff was just clubbing us and coming in. When it was all gone and over, it was quiet, like dead quiet. Uh, I know St. John's was hit, uh, and that area was hit real hard right there by St. John's. I'm heading that direction. We're going to have the worst damage around 20th in Maine. We've got whole buildings missing, multiple subjects injured. Immediately, we stepped out and there's some wires hanging down from the ceiling. Staff said, are these wires hot? And I said, I don't know. Looks like there's a light on over at step down. 
which was a bad sign because if those lights are on, then chances are we got electricity in the lines and we don't know which ones. I worried about somebody being electrocuted. I said, you know, it looks like they're hot. Um, everybody just needs to do what they feel comfortable doing. But if you can get to the patients, if you can move, move things out of the way so we can get them extracted. And I noticed that you know, the fire, the sirens coming. And so it made me think, wow, people are gonna be coming to the hospital. And I felt like I needed to warn uh, the officials that at least where we were at, the hospital was destroyed. So I opened my phone and I had, you know, bars and I called 911 and I said, I need you to listen very carefully. The hospital has been uh, hit, it's been damaged. And I don't know if the entire hospital is out of commission or it's just the top floors where I'm at, but I would suggest that you probably call other cities and let them know that we've had a crisis. Jack, go to all stations, Fire West, be advised St. John's was hit in this storm. Put a call out to all off-duty New County deputies to report in for duty. It's like being in a blender, in a way. If you take a blender and you're running a blender, what gets stuck is down at the base. And you have to get a you know, spoon and dig that out to get it up in the blades, you know? So as long as you stay below that area, if you have something to hang on to, the lower you can get yourself, you got a chance. And uh, that's what we did, and it worked, okay? Because there were people that didn't make it behind us and people that didn't make it across the street. And so we just did the right thing at the right time. Panic never helps anybody. A lot of people, I think, panicked and got caught in bad places. Me being an elected official and a county coroner, waiting for my phone to ring, uh, expecting if it's actually this bad or even marginally that bad, I should be notified. Well, another 15, 20 minutes goes by, my phone doesn't ring. Well, uh, I found that strange, so I went ahead and called in to uh, 911. Well, I can't get through. And as anybody knows, if you can't get through to 911, something big is up, catastrophic. About 10 to 12 feet from me around the corner when I was standing in the tornado, the roof fell in on a, a patient who was in her 40s. She was, uh, had a horrible, horrible heart condition. Heart was extremely weak. What's the strange thing, one of the nurses I knew very well brought me a paper and she said, Dr. Smalling, she said, this patient gave her her name. She wrote this letter, this note, and I wanted you to see it. And I looked at it and it was in black ink and she said, I'm weary, I'm tired. Um, I know the doctors and staff have done all they can do. I know I'm not gonna be able to live much longer. I just am tired and I want to go home. I want to go to heaven. The ceiling had fallen in on this lady and had knocked her off of her ventilator. She knew something was going on in her spirit. So at that point, I decided, well, I probably need to make my way into Joplin. Obviously, that's where the tornado hit. I make my way to the Joplin Police Department. They're on the north side of town, just a few miles from my home. And as I pull up, there's lots of people around. As I would figure out later on, they're volunteers. Once I see somebody I know, they, they grab me and they take me to the basement, which uh, they call their EOC, Emergency Operations Center. And at that point, they try to brief me on what has happened. They said, prepare to be here a while. We've got many deaths. Trees and houses everywhere down, just FYI, this area. She's got uh, her family in a pickup here. It looks pretty much like uh, DOA. With the Humvee, uh, got multiple casualties. Is there anybody else in this area? We have a female that's in labor. Where is the nearest place she can go and find a doctor? They were going to St. John's. Negative, St. John's was knocked out by the storm. All the patients from St. John's are being transported to Memorial Hall by school buses. Overheard on Jasper County frequency earlier. I believe Joplin's radio system is down. There is a report that there are people trapped on the roof of St. John's. When the Joplin Fire Department got there, the firemen said, I'm so sorry, uh, we would have been here sooner, but the two 
the fire stations they had were completely demolished, blown away, and they were trying to find the people that work there. He said, we need to try to mobilize and get everybody out of here. We probably only have about an hour and a half of daylight. Desi, Sammy, and I walked across the street. I have a picture of us because I was so overwhelmed by what I was seeing. I turned around and looked what we came out of and there was nothing left, but at knee high at best, left on the lot. Okay, and so I thought, well, there's no way anybody could live through that. You know, I thought, well, maybe we're, maybe we're all dead and we, you know, this is what death is about. I mean, you don't, you don't know what to believe at that time. They tell me where they've set up this temporary morgue, which is on the north end of the portion of Joplin that had been devastated. There's wind damage there, but the, the church is still standing. And so I slowly try to make my way down there. And at this point, it's getting dark, and it's not just debris laying on the ground. It's like cleaned off the streets. It's, you know, things where they shouldn't be, houses upside down, uh, things you only see on TV. And that's when I realized this is extremely intense. None of us would have ever thought about leaving um, until we knew everybody was safe. I think they said we successfully evacuated 183 people, 173 people successfully without anyone dying after the initial tornado hit. Um, there was roughly five people who were killed in the hospital. The back of my head was real hot, my neck was swelling, and when I touched the back of my head, I had blood in my hair and everything, so I knew you know, we were still alive and I was limping. And so, you know, pain was good at that moment, actually, because you knew you were alive still. These are minor things. Uh, you know, just the fact you lived is a major thing. And uh, then you start seeing what happened to others. And all my ordeal was minor, you know, compared to uh, what happened to so many. And um, the wounds that were coming into the hospital were horrific. I show up at this church and I can see the devastation to the south. Buildings are gone, not leveled like they've been demolished to the ground, gone, blown away. So I make entry to the church. Uh, that's when I see my first body that somebody has already brought there, covered with a blanket. And I realize that I cannot function in a dark basement of a church. We have got to find another venue. I'm driving on 32nd Street East to stay at the Residence Inn. There was a few people coming there from the tornado looking for a room, and they said, we don't have any power. Um, it's all been knocked out. So I went in, and the manager of the hotel was there, and we talked a minute and a little bit about things. He goes, well, everything's melting in the freezer, so come down and have all the ice cream you want. So. We did, and we listened to things on the radio. I was able to text my family and let them know I was okay. I got in the hotel, and they texted me back that they would come over the next day and, and get me. And that's when I ran into a highway patrolman. He came in to assist me. He was able to reach out, and uh, we were able to gain access to use a parking lot of a local university. And at least there we had lighting we could see what we were doing. I was looking at approximately 80, 90 deceased bodies in this parking lot. I'm waiting for refrigerated trailers to come in so we can get them into refrigeration. Um, that's when I got a phone call a couple hours later before morning that from the governor's office asking me what I need. At that point, I need more body bags. We're just getting started. and. They took care of me. Within two hours, we had more body bags. When everything gets quiet, then you realize that how real all this is and all these lives that have been lost. That's when you, you, it makes your heart just break. But, you know, there's nothing else you can do. So the most I can do is respect these people. And that's what I was there to do. America hadn't seen a destructive tornado of this magnitude in half a century. 150 people lost their lives.
and 1,150 were injured. It caused nearly $3 billion worth of damages, and the path the tornado tore through Joplin can still be seen to this day. The medical team in this community was very strong to begin with, and they really rose to the occasion of all that. They just immediately went to work with it, and those people are used to trauma. They're used to adversity. They stay calm. They stay focused. And uh, there are a lot of unsung heroes with that. And I've relived those moments during and after the tornado for years now. Um, I can't believe it's been seven years. Joplin was never the same for the three and a half years I worked there. After. People couldn't find work. They left. Um, it's 2000, probably 14, 15. It began to really regrow, but I don't know that it'll ever be the same. As human beings, we have a wide range of experiences that we've been through, and some are so common that we almost have a script for them in our minds. But in a traumatic event like this, we don't have a script. This is new. We don't go through this stuff all the time. And so part of what our mind wants to do is to create that script, to file this away like it's filed everything else away, to know how to handle it next time if it happens again. Joplin's tried to make itself a better town. And it really has grown up. It, it, it is, people have rebuilt and it made the town a, a prettier town. Anytime we have bad weather, you prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And pay attention. You can't live in fear. Uh, you've got to live your life and just don't forget the past.